thyroid parathyroid glands are located in the anterior neck region, just inferior to the thyroid cartilage. That's of the larynx. We'll get to that in respiratory. That's kind of what you're looking at there. I kind of wanted to use the app to kind of introduce it for those of you who have never seen it before. So we've got the skeleton here. I've got my systems on the bottom. I'm going to turn on endocrine. thyroid gland highlighted in green. I want to turn on respiratory so we can get the larynx in there. Okay, there's the thyroid cartilage just superior to the thyroid gland. I'm going to throw on um, digestion. Okay. <coughs> now the parathyroids are four little nodules posterior. So let me hide the skeleton. Put the bones off. Let's go to the posterior view, just rotate it around there. Now, now we're posterior, that's your food tube, that's the esophagus. Uh, and I've highlighted in green, <coughs> those four dots, colored green on the parathyroid glands, they help control blood calcium, I learned about how today. Okay, so that's a posterior view. That's an anterior view. Again, that's the thyroid cartilage. Thyroid means shield shape. So that's shaped like a shield. So the thyroid gland, I guess, I don't know, it's kind of shaped like a shield too, I guess. Uh, but anyways, that's the name of it. And let's go back to the pictures from the book. There's a posterior view. On the right, on the left, is an anterior view. And we see the four pair nodules. And we're able to identify them. And we looked at them under the microscope too. And this is kind of similar to what I showed you under a low mag. Answer the question. What is X in? Thyroid. Yeah, the colloid is a much brighter pink. And all the chief cells are in this parathyroid gland. And the chief cells secrete. Uh, PTH really gets that. But let's look at the, the follicle structure first. Pictures of it. We talked about it uh, yesterday for the histology. They look like little stakes. Colloid has that flush tone color in this. But I remember that's what my lab instructor told us to help us remember how to identify it. Okay. So what you've got are colloid surrounded by identified cell. Follicle cell. I could ask that today. Or if it's outside the follicle, by default, C cell or para or parafollicular cell. Very good. It's a closer up picture. This kind of looks more similar to our slide collection. The whole thing's a thyroid follicle, colloid in, colloid in the middle. You could also put as an answer, spell it out, thyroglobulin. It's an inactive form of thyroid hormone, you need to extract iodide from the blood, okay, because um, cells can't synthesize it. So here's an illustration of the thyroid follicle. Let's talk about thyroid hormone. The appropriate name is, well, more technical, it's T3, T4. also known as T3, T4. Now T3, the threes are basically the number of iodide molecules attached to it. So you can call T3 a triiodothyronine. T3 
four. is a thyroxine, that's its name. So, the follicle cells will secrete the thyroid hormone, okay? But remember, this requires Iodine. And that extraction, we'll go through the steps, the cell physiology. Okay. For now, just kind of list the hormone names. Now, the other cell type that secretes hormones in the thyroid gland is the parafollicular cells. They secrete the hormone, parathyroid hormone. So basically, um, I'm sorry, they, uh, let, me, let me wake up. Calcitonin is secreted by the parafollicular cells. to lower blood calcium. Should you eat broccoli or a glass of milk, something that has contains a lot of calcium, your blood level of calcium goes up and uh, calcitonin can help lower it. I do want you to know how that um, calcitonin lowers calcium levels. So we always talk about the mechanism in physiology. So let's go through these bullet points here. They do this by inhibiting osteoclast activity. So basically, let's continue this up here. Mechanism, first point. Inhibit osteoclast activity. I'll just put a down arrow. <coughs> osteoclast activity. If you remember from uh, 430, those are the bone <coughs> cells that are active resorbers. They kind of break down the, uh, the bone matrix, the inorganic cellular matrix. Kind of look like that. Uh, a cell with a rough <coughs> border with multi-nucleated nuclei. And from that rough border, all these lighted chemicals will break down the bone matrix liberating calcium to release it to the bloodstream. So if you inhibit those guys, <coughs> if you remember the other cell that builds bone, doesn't break it down? Osteoblasts. If these are inhibited by default, the osteoblasts are elevated. So their activity increases, which allows them to promote calcium uptake into the bone. increase, you know, calcium deposition into the bone matrix. The third point is increase calcium excretion at the kidney.
kidney, um, well, basically, excretion is a physiology ward. So, I mean, think about it this way. You, you have the kidney, it's filtering the blood. You got the renal artery. Delivers blood to be filtered by the kidney. There's a lot of things that are reabsorbed in renal vein. So if you go in to the, to the black box, the kidney get filtered, and you make it back out, you are not lost to the earth. However, some things are. Here's the ureter coming out. Things go in, things come out. If they're filtered and not reabsorbed, you lose it to the kidney. That's excretion. So what we're saying is calcitonin has the ability to increase excretion. So, you know, all of those things are taking calcium out of the blood, you put it into the bone matrix, or just lose it to the urine. So that's going to lower the blood calcium. All right, so that's the mechanism. I'm going to move on. Talk about parathyroid hormone because if you have a hormone that lowers the level, you need one that raises it too. It's located in the parathyroid gland. The, the cell I want you to know that's in the parathyroid gland is the chief cell. Chief or principal cell, and they secrete TH. Raises blood calcium levels. So I kind of zoomed in there. Um, here are the four nodules are the parathyroid gland. And in this figure, they're, they're trying to show you if calcium levels are low, you want to raise it. So over here, they illustrate red balls are calcium, so there's not a lot of it. So I guess the, the blue triangles represent what? The P, the normal? Yeah, PTH. So the first thing they do is they show it going to the bone. First mechanism, PTH activates osteoclasts. Oh, okay, All right. So that kind of liberates calcium from the bone matrix. But that'll do it. So this is the mechanisms of the PTH. There's our osteoclasts. I'm just going to draw it. Increase osteoclast activity. That will raise the blood calcium. Secondly, increase calcium reabsorption from the kidney. I erased my picture of the kidney, but basically it'll leave the renal vein and you won't lose it to the urine. Less calcium lost to urine. So that'll help raise calcium levels. 
And the last thing, number three, it promotes, what you do is just absorb it from the diet, right? Get it from the gut. PTH promotes kidneys activation through vitamin D, which you know increases uh, calcium absorption from food. So it, it's acting through vitamin D. Through vitamin D promote calcium absorption from gut. A lot of vegetables that have kind of like the dark green color or high in calcium. A stock of uh, broccoli has like over 70 megs of calcium. Uh, so that's good for you too. Uh, all right. Basically, you're getting it from the gut and you're losing less to the feces. So that's the mechanism. And you can see like the red balls on, these, on this side that there's more red balls. To illustrate to the student that you've elevated calcium levels. So let's do a little mental gymnastics. I'm trying to get you ready for a multiple choice test next week, Wednesday. Um, take some time. Answer this. PTH. Remember what multiple choice questions are, how to answer them. We were doing it for quizzes. This one's a little more beefy. Consider each choice. Does it make sense? Is it A and C? Go. Let's see what you come up with. Commit yourself to an answer. Write it down so that if you got it wrong, you can't deny it. All right, let me check back in. Um, I hear you guys, it's a vibrant discussion, but um, I think what helps first when you study, you have to remember what it does. Okay, you can't guess if you can't remember what PTH does. What does PTH do? Raise or lower calcium levels? It raises it. Okay, if you're armed with that correct information, then evaluate the choices. It raises it, choice A. Increases osteoclast activity, this increases blood calcium levels. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Good check. Good. So far, let's go to the next one. Increases osteoclast activity. This decreases blood. No? No. Uh -oh. That doesn't make sense. Like the decrease thing. Okay. Okay, C. Increases calcium excretion at the kidney. So if you excrete it, lose it to the urine, is that going to raise it? No. It's going to lower it. C is no good, which makes D no good, which makes A the correct choice. Uh, you need one more shot. Do calcitonin.
All right, what'd you get for number two? B. B. I hear a lot of, did you say B? B. As in boy? Okay, let's, yeah. let's go through. Again, let's go through the logic. Okay, calcitonin, pretend you're taking the test. Calcitonin, does it raise or lower? Oh, it lowers blood calcium. Okay, armed with that correct information, go through the choices. Decreases osteoclast activity. This in, no, it doesn't increase blood calcium level. Okay, so B. Decreases osteoclast activity, yeah. This decreases blood calcium levels. Yeah, that's what we talked about. If you decrease that, then the osteoblasts win. Yeah. They'll deposit more. Okay, B's looking good. Increases the breakdown. Well, if you did that, wouldn't you increase blood calcium levels? You would, so yeah. C's not looking good, which makes D not good, B is correct. Okay, then again, you know, I, it's funny, I, I wrote these questions, but every time I come up to them, every time I teach this class, I'm like, I don't miss being a student answering this kind of stuff. I don't miss it. Just throwing that out there. Fortunately, we do have to hold you accountable for the material. Uh, all right, let's get back to thyroid hormone. I'm done talking about regulation of blood calcium. We got T3, T4. Thyroxin, T4, which means four iodines are attached. That's the major one that's secreted. Turns out that's mostly inactive. So it's like you're taking it making it in an inactive form so you don't prematurely activate tissue you don't want to. It's like, it's like when T3, that's the active form. When T4 gets close to the target tissue, it's converted to T3, close to the target tissue. T4 is mostly secreted. It's converted to T3, that's the active form. Close to the target tissue. Usually there's an enzyme there that can do this, close to the target tissue. some effects of T3. Well, because it uh, increases your metabolic rate, um, well, it's going to burn calories and well, that will have an effect of lowering blood glucose. I'm, I'm going to note that here because there's not a lot of hormones that lower blood glucose. Most of them raise blood glucose. Increase metabolism. That has the effect of Lowering blood glucose. The only other one would be insulin. All the other hormones we've been talking about kind of raise it. All right, so moving on. It's lipid-soluble hormone. It has receptors in the cytoplasm, in the mitochondria, in the nucleus. It has receptors everywhere because it's trying to increase cellular activity by boosting your metabolism. So you, you would expect it to have receptors kind of everywhere. Now, like we said, the thyroid gland secretes 90% of thyroid hormone in the form of T4. It's converted to T3 close to the target. Skeletal muscle, endocrine tissues, they kind of have receptors for the thyroid hormone. So, thyroid, it's anterior pituitary dependent, right? And we know the name of the hormone for that. It's under TSH control, it's gonna say here. Formation of thyroid hormone is under TSH control. Um, falling T4 blood levels stimulate TSH release. Rising T4 levels inhibit TSH release. Okay. So, under TSH control, increase T4, uh, that's the negative feedback. Now, this synthesis, like I said, it requires iodine. Requires iodine. It's under TSH control, but 
We need iodine circulating in the blood. So I'm writing it requires iodine to be extracted. from the blood by the follicle cells. happens if uh, you live in a place that's kind of landlocked, not close to kind of seawater, um, where there's not a lot of uh, salinity to it, not a lot of electrolytes into it, and you get what's called a colloidal goiter. What, well, what's happening is um, the follicular cells, they know how to make the thyroglobulin. They can do that. But if you can't extract the iodine from the blood, the T4 levels aren't going to elevate because you can't make it. So TSH is going to keep stimulating this gland. And TSH, well, you'll just keep making the thyroglobulin and the colloidal uh, goiter will form as a result. Okay. So in this case, it will be easily reversible by just adding sodium iodide to the diet. Anyways, here's the uh, cell physiology of thyroid hormone. small here, I'll kind of write out on the board. The first step is right here. These green balls are iodide, and um, let's see. it says thyroglobulin, oh, let's start here. Okay, what's happening here is, let me give you a big overview. You're making thyroglobulin and secreting it into the colloid, yellow <coughs> stuff, follicle cell, blood vessel. So in parallel, you're secreting the thyroglobulin into the colloid in parallel with extracting the iodide, converting it to iodine, and getting it in there. Those things are kind of happening at the same time. However, you know, we're kind of like going step by step. So let's start with step one. Thyroglobulin is synthesized and um, discharged into the, what they say, the, the follicle lumen, what we call the colloid. under TSH control. All the cell. <coughs> Synthesizes thyroid lobulin. Basically secretes it into the colloid. cell can extract iodide from the blood, and that's shown in step two. Iodide is trapped, um, there's a little enzyme there, and, you know, it traps it. That's also under TSH control. This is all under TSH control. I don't want to keep writing it. Kind of make a note to yourself. So, that's iodide. It's trapped into the follicle cell. That's basically step two. You're extracting it from the blood, getting into the cell. And then step number three, there's an enzyme here that will convert. You will basically oxidize it. Iodide is oxidized and becomes iodine. So in the illustrate, illustration, they kind of draw the iodide as a green ball. But notice that when it's oxidized, in step three, they use 
blue ball to illustrate. So I'm writing it's oxidized, it becomes iodine. Usually a molecular formula is I2 and it's symbolized on this figure by the blue balls. So that, that's being secreted to the uh, colloid. So in step four, you iodinate um, the tyrosine residues of the thyroglobulin. So the tyrosines are the part that are important. Tyrosine is one of the amino acids, right? And so this is a protein, so it's got amino acids. You iodinate the tyrosine residues, those amino acids. Iodinate. Tyrosine amino acids. Now, um, let's see what color should I use for that. How about, uh, how about red? Red bars. Okay. <coughs> so when you iodinate, here's a tyrosine. So let's say you shove one iodine on it. Let's just call it MIT. Stands for mono iodothyronine. I used to always call it MIT. M for mono. Take a tyrosine residue and you shove two of them on it. That's dip for dye, two. So basically, the formation of mitt and dip. That's step four. Step five, you conjugate them. They're linked together and they form T3, T4. Conjugation of mitten dip forming T3, T4. So basically, uh, let's take a, if you go mitten dip. those together you get something like this is that T3 or T4 T3 1 2 3 okay, you're just counting the iodides So this is the uh, conjugation of a mint and a dip. What if you were to add a dip and a dip? get T4. That's conjugating the mitt and the dip. Now you can start to uh, get ready to secrete that. This is occurring kind of at the border between the colloid and the follicle. Uh, step five is to, well, I'll be okay. Step five was, all right, here's step five. Step six. The thyroglobulin colloid is endocytosed. And, uh, well, you're going to combine it with the lysosome. Continue on up here with step six.
thyroglobulin, well, I'll put in parentheses, now iodinated, right? You got T3, T4 with T3, T4. This endocytose by follicle cell. Combine it with the lysosome because you got to clean it up. So then step seven is the lysosomal enzymes, they cleave off the T3, T4, and secrete it. Step seven. T3, T4, cleaved off of thyroglobulin. And then are secreted. That is T3, T4. T3 and T4 are secreted, not the thyroglobulin. Let's take a look at that. Here's another way to illustrate the thyroglobulin. It's in its kind of sort of globular structure, the red line. Red line is thyroglobulin. It has the tyrosine residues on it. The iodinate, right? That's the dip in the dip. There's T4 after they've been conjugated. You gotta, you gotta cleave it off of there and secrete it. Okay. Moving on. Any questions on thyroid parathyroid? I'm doing the next one pancreas. It's a gland that's basically located behind the stomach in a space called the lesser sac. Located posterior to the stomach. The space called the lesser sac. Sometimes it's also called the omental bursa. Back to the uh, app to show you that. We've got the digestive system on from before. And you can turn on the skeleton so you can orient yourself a little bit. Okay, that's, that's what we're dealing with. We're in the uh, primarily the, the abdominal cavity, right? So the lesser sac is basically behind the stomach. The greater sac is basically where all your guts are, right? So I'm going to highlight the uh, stomach there. Stomach. I'm going to go high stomach. And you can see the pancreas behind it, highlighted in green. Right there. Okay, so that's the pancreas behind the stomach. I'm going to hide skeleton. 
Let's take a posterior view. You can see that the pancreas looks like an inverted tobacco pipe. The head of it is nestled in part of the small intestine called the, uh, the duodenum, but we'll get to that. But basically, that's the location of the pancreas. Here's some pictures from the book, those of you that bought the Gilroy Atlas of anatomy. And, uh, well, what they did in the picture on the right is they cut along, this fat apron is called the omentum, uh, the greater omentum. So it's called the greater omentum because this curvature is the greater curvature of the stomach. And when you cut along that border and lift the stomach up, you can see the tail of the pancreas behind it in the lesser sac. There's another picture. The picture on the right is more dissected than the one on the left. They've removed a lot of organs. They removed liver and gallbladder. The liver was here. You always got liver on the right, spleen on the left. Liver on the right, spleen on the left. That's always how I remember it. You have the tail of the pancreas here. The head of the pancreas is nestled in the duodenum. Okay, so basically I just want you to know where the pancreas is. All right, now. In terms of endocrines, when we looked at this, this is a professional picture. My picture wasn't too bad. I don't look like that. You got the pancreatic island, that's the endocrine function. So I'm writing, the pancreatic island has cells that have the endocrine function. Here's a picture that I took unlabeled, can you find it? You'll have to do that today, and some of you know, when I pass out the lab today, they're not all the same, but if you get one where you're required to find pancreatic islet, a big, a big mistake, it's not a big mistake, but a mistake students commonly make is you just look for the thing that stands out, but not everything that stands out is the pancreatic islet. Is that it? No. It's a duct. If you see something that looks like it has a lumen, it's probably the main pancreatic duct. This is a blood vessel. I see the red blood cells in there. Uh, that's probably a blood vessel too. That's it. That's a good one. These two are really good. Because yeah, you see like lighter staining cells. I see the cell nuclei. It's a clump of cells. Boom, boom, and boom. Maybe, yeah, kind of down there too. They're kind of uh, scattered all over that field of vision. Right, let's move on. The cells, you, you gotta know. Basically, alpha beta, because okay? they secrete the hormones glucagon and um, insulin. So that's alpha. So the alpha cells, they secrete glucagon. Don't worry about the other ones, metastatin, pancreatic body, peptide, don't worry about it. Okay, so beta. So there's some facts for, you know, uh, glucagon. I call it the exercise hormone because it kind of increases the, the glucose levels required for exercise. It's a hyperglycemic agent, raises blood sugar. Increases blood glucose, the basic idea there. Glucose is the circulation form of carbohydrate. So it's going to target liver and skeletal muscle. That's where you have most of your uh, glycogen stores. And what it'll do, it, it will um, do both gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. Okay.
accomplishes both of those, the main target, I would say, is skull and muscle. And liver. So targets. So that, that, that's basically it there, OK? Uh, let's go to the insulin. The beta cells, they're hypoglycemic. Beta cells create insulin. Insulin is the hypo glycemic agent. It's going to lower blood glucose. Thyroid hormone and insulin, those are the only hormones I'm aware of that have this effect. Okay. So uh, insulin, it decreases blood glucose. It's going to target adipose and skeletal muscle. Those are its primary targets. It's going to promote insulin-sensitive tissues to take up glucose from the blood and into the cell. In the cell, then insulin, well, it'll utilize the glucose for fuel. Maybe it'll store it. Okay, maybe, maybe it'll make protein and triglyceride. It's your major anabolic hormone. So insulin-sensitive tissues, the targets are adipose. Skeletal muscle. What it's going to do is, I'm going to utilize glucose. You're going to metabolize it for fuel, or you're going to do a lot of anabolic things like protein and triglyceride synthesis. Increase. Protein triglyceride synthesis. And this is one of the first slides I presented on Monday, and it comes back kind of at the end of the unit. We've looked at it before. Top half is insulin. The bottom half is glucagon. And it's basically, um, well, I think we just covered this. So I just wanted to remind you we had looked at it before. Now, what may be helpful in preparation for the exam on Wednesday, um, we, we talk a lot about the effects <coughs> on the three main um, molecules that we can that provide nourishment for humans. Fat, <coughs> protein, glucose. Okay. And the effects of all these hormones on each of those. Do they break it down? Do they increase it? You know, I sat down and I went through each one and I was like, huh, there's no real pattern here. Maybe I should just kind of do it for them and let them look at it themselves. <coughs> um, e and NE is epi, norepi. And thyroid hormone is TH. Okay. And so that's kind of not for me to teach, just for you to kind of look at in your studies. <coughs> just tell yourself, well, I can go back and look at that table that's in the slides. Now, if you have a um, problem with insulin, <coughs> that causes a condition called diabetes insipidus. I'm sorry, no, diabetes mellitus. I should have put that one a second. Diabetes mellitus is a problem with insulin. There's two types. There's either type 1 or type 2. Type 2 is like a, basically 95% of all diabetes cases where insulin is there, but it's not working. So the blood glucose stays elevated with elevated insulin levels. So hyperinsulinemia is a symptom of diabetes mellitus. The kidneys, a lot of uh, glucose spills in the urine, so you have sweet urine. Um, I've heard the ancient Egyptians, they used to like test for diabetes by tasting the urine. And, well, thankfully, we don't have to do that anymore. We have test strips. Now, diabetes insipidus is a deficiency in ADH. So let's think about that. ADH is an anti-diuretic. So without it, you have a problem with diuresis. You increase the urine output, and that makes urine taste it's like water. Okay, it's probably very clear. It should be a... a a straw colored yellow. It's a normal color. So I just didn't want it, you to confuse the terms diabetes insipidus and diabetes mellitus. Uh, there are two different hormones there. Okay, let's take a break. Uh,
we come back, we have a still quiz. So prepare for that uh, 15 minutes. Don't be late. You might miss part of the quiz. <laughs>